Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Madrasa Midrasha's event for April, um, Comparative Approaches in Jewish and Islamic Studies. My name is Majabin Dalla. I have the honor to serve as director of this program, this fantastic program, uh, and the pleasure of inviting you all and welcoming you all, especially our two amazing presenters, which we're so excited to hear from. Um, and it is also my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Dina Aronoff to help me moderate this amazing event. Uh, Dina, as we all know, is faculty director of the Richard S. Dinner Center for, Islam uh, Center for Jewish Studies here at the Graduate Theological Union. She's also a senior lecturer here with us, and she teaches rabbinic literature, medieval patterns of Jewish uh, thought, and uh, the broader question of continuity uh, and change in Jewish history. So without further ado, welcome Dina. Dina's going to welcome our first speaker and we'll take it from there. Uh, please remember that uh, you can always put in your questions in the, in the box below and we'll be able to address them in the later part of this program. And at some point in the program, Matt, our assistants will also be sending you a link in the chat for our Madrasa Midrasha Summer Intensive that we're offering this summer, but I'll tell you more about it a little later uh, into the program. So welcome everyone and welcome Dina. Thank you so much. And it has been such a privilege to share, um, share uh, this program and to be guided by Majabin's vision as the director of Madrasa Midrasha program here at the Graduate Theological Union. Um, the Center for Jewish Studies and the Center for Islamic Studies have in many ways become a, a single community and it's with thanks to the conversations like the ones we're about to have today. Um, so thank you to both of our speakers for joining us. Um, it's, I would like to introduce Noah Bargabai uh, who will speak first um, and then we'll have an introduction of uh, Jerusha Rhodes um, following Noah's talk. Uh, Noah Bargabai uh, teaches in the SWIG program of Jewish Studies and Social Justice at the University of San Francisco, so just across the bay. And we're also very lucky that uh, Noah has also been teaching here at the Center for Jewish Studies, a course that very much draws from her expertise uh, and her research. And Noah's research explores the critical interpretations of secularism, tradition, and state as suggested by the Hebrew narratives of Mizrahi or Arab Jewish authors. When I speak with Noah about her scholarship, I'm always struck by the fact that her materials and her thinking really defies the kind of binary ways that these materials have often been organized in terms of Jew, Muslim, East, West. And just by staying close to her beloved literature, I think Noah is able to really shed light on the intersections, commonalities, uh, the full fabric of Jews in the Arabic speaking world. Um, and so we're really in for a treat today because Noah's talk focuses directly on this. Um, and if I may introduce uh, the talk itself, it's titled Traces of Vanished Jewish Muslim Symbiosis in Mizrahi Traditionalism. And in the talk we're about to hear, Noah will explore, explore Mizrahi traditionalism often called Masoratiyut, which can be understood as a dynamic relation to Jewish law and tradition that grew out of patterns of Islamic modernization. So Noah is gonna take us through the ways in which patterns of Islamic modernization help to make sense of this powerful Jewish cultural and religious phenomenon. Chaviva Pedaya and Albert Suisa, Hebrew writers with roots in the Muslim world, portray Mizrahi traditionalism as a kind of trace, a link to a Muslim Jewish past that is erased by Zionism, but also challenges its reliance on the binary poles of secular and religious. Noah, we're very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dina, for such a detailed, kind introduction. I'm also delighted and honored to be here. And I've thought about these questions a lot from the Mizrahi or Arab Jewish angle. So it's really a delight to be in conversation with Dr. Rhodes um, and I wish everyone a Ramadan Kareem. 
So as Dina said, the title of my talk is Traces of Vanished Jewish Muslim Symbiosis in Mizrahi Traditionism or Masortiyut. And I will be using that Hebrew word Masortiyut. It comes from the word Masoret, which means tradition. You may also have heard of the Masorti movement, which is the Hebrew name for the American conservative Jewish movement, but that is a totally different use of Masorti. And um, I'll clarify throughout the talk, what, what is this Masorti position? So before I get to my main points, I just wanna define the in interrelated terms of Mizrahi and Masortiyut. Mizrahi in Hebrew means literally Eastern or Oriental, and it describes Jews from the Middle East, North Africa, parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. This is a population that was systematically excluded within the Zionist project from Zionist leadership and discriminated against in areas such as housing, education, employment by the Ashkenazi or European Jewish mainstream. Um, and there is a complex relationship between Mizrahi Jews, Ashkenazim, and Palestinians, where often Mizrahi Jews, at least in scholarly and academic context, context are seen as Arab Jews, right, in a way that undermines the binary between uh, Jew and Arab and between Jew and Palestinian um, in a certain way. Of course, Mizrahim being included in the project of the state in a way that Palestinians obviously tragically are not. Um, were, uh, in a sense, in a slightly more privileged position in that way. Um, and I use this term Mizrahi, um, even though it's, it's limited because it artificially consolidates groups of Jews from many distinctive cultures, right? We're talking about Jews from somewhere like Bulgaria and Yemen and Morocco as under one umbrella. Um, and of course, in some ways, a Jew from Morocco would be from the Maghreb, which actually um, means West um, and is actually West of Europe. So, so in some ways it doesn't quite make sense, but it's the most commonly self-ascriptive term. Um, and, and so uh, that's why I use it. Um, and I will sometimes use the term Arab Jew. Um, and really Mizrahi kind of straddles the line between a, a racial category. That's how the scholar Brian Roby tends to interpret it. And he also uh, highlights its associations with blackness. And Roby also uses the term Afro-Asian Jews because uh, that includes within it Beta Israel, who are Jews from Ethiopia. Um, Sami Shalom Shitri sees Mizrahi actually more of a, as a social political term, um, one that's based less on ethnic origins. Um, and there's also a lot of overlap between the term Mizrahi and Sephardi. Sephardi Jews are Jews who originate in Spain, but also Jews from all across the Arab and Muslim world use Sephardi Nusaf, that is liturgical style, and also um, Sephardi thought and legal rulings. And so there's, again, a lot of overlap between Mizrahi Arab Jew um, and Sephardi. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about what is Masortiyut. And that's really my focus with regard to Mizrahim is this dynamic, flexible, but committed Jewish outlook. And one very widespread example of who is Masorti is someone who um, in the, the context of Israel-Palestine, a Jew who attends synagogue on Shabbat morning, but then will go play soccer the same afternoon, um, maybe this person is wearing a kippah, yarmulke, maybe not. So um, this might not seem so surprising, but um, in Israel-Palestine and specifically within uh, the state of Israel and its categories of identity for Jews, um, there's a very clear binary between secular and orthodox. And I'll talk in various ways about how this is sustained by institutions and really by the philosophy of the Zionist project and its aspirations to secularize Jewish identity um, in the form of national sovereignty, right? So, um, so this Masorti who's going to synagogue and playing soccer um, has a flexible relationship, right, to tradition. There's enough of a, an adherence to halakha and Jewish law um, that there's regular synagogue attendance, but of course, 
um, it is not within normative halakha, what normative halakha would permit uh, to play a game of soccer on the Sabbath, especially say if you're driving to that game of soccer. Um, and this is usually seen, it has been a very kind of degraded form um, in the sense that it's seen as not quite enlightened enough to be secular and not really committed enough to be orthodox. But in recent years with what we call the post-secular turn, this is really changing. So in the um, 80s and 90s, there was a reconsideration among scholars of the kind of Weberian secularization narrative that the world is, as the world becomes more modern, it's becoming more secular um, and it will culminate in an enlightenment that, that indicates a complete break with the religious past. This is something that post-secularism reconsiders and within the, the context of Israel-Palestine, um, Masorti'im and the kind of rehabilitation of Masorti as something not degraded, but is actually very productive, suggestive of new possibilities has been a really key part of, of post-secularism um, in that context. And that's associated with scholars such as Yaakov Yadgar and Yofi Fisher. Um, and for, for Yadgar, he says this is really actually not at all um, an incoherent or haphazard way of being that Masorti'im themselves, in fact, do have a lot of deliberateness with how they go about um, choosing and maneuvering between um, religious and secular expressions. And Another important point is that um, Masorti really stands in contrast to the way um, Jewish Israeli society, politics, media, the education system are again, largely organized around these binary poles of, of the Orthodox and the secular. Um, and also Zionism is, there are many forms of Zionism of course, but one of the main aims of Zionism was to secularize Jewish identity in the modern world by nationalizing it, by um, making it a, a privileged form of identity with territorial sovereignty. Um, but paradoxically, this national identity was never fully divorced from its theological roots, right? If you think about really the, the Zionist justification for sovereignty, it is a biblical one. This is really encapsulated by the historian Amnon Raz Krakotskin's well-known saying, um, we don't believe in God, but he promised us this land, right? And so um, in many ways, this um, secular orthodox binary does the work of maintaining a nationalized secular identity. Um, and it does this through something called the status quo, which is a kind of politics of accommodation between the so-called secular and the orthodox parties in which the secular parties say we are democratic, um, but we have this, these orthodox parties that are actually coercing and enforcing religious law upon us. Um, but, but in truth, that's actually the way to maintain the Jewish identity of the state in a situation where Jewish identity is nationalized and it is, um, uh, paired with national sovereignty. And so for Yadgar, um, Masortiyut as a kind of um, third way has a potential to, to question all that and to think of new possibilities for how Jewish identity can be understood, um, perhaps even in a way that is divorced from national sovereignty um, and, and privileged citizenship. Um, but I, I want to talk also about this connection between Masortiyut and Islam and how it originates in the centuries long coexistence of Jews in, Ar in Arab and Muslim countries. And um, here I'm following uh, Shlomo Dov Goitain, the anthropologist who famously, famously spoke of this creative symbiosis between Muslims and Jews. Um, Nisim Leon, an uh, Israeli sociologist, describes the intertwined cultural, social, political worlds of Jews in Muslim lands. This is a quote from Leon. Unlike Christend Christendom, the Muslim world did not perceive Judaism as a political or a theological threat, end quote. 
Uh, Jews lived largely as demi populations, so they did have to pay a kind of capitulation tax. They did face some persecution. There were limitations on their rights and freedoms, but they weren't seen as a theological threat uh, in the way that they were perceived in Europe. And Leon goes on to say that Jews played an integral role in the development of Arab Muslim culture, and that culture in turn had a very decisive influence on the Jewish community. Um, Leon explains that rabbis often served as arbitrators for Muslims in legal cases, and Sadiqim, who are saintly Jews, were mythologized both by Jews and Muslims. The anthropologist Bjorn Bilu has said that saints in Morocco, for example, were both, quote, very Jewish and very Muslim, uh, because there was a lot of overlap in terms of who would worship whom, who would visit whom. Um, and, and this is also seen in, so in, in Judaism, this practice is called hilula, that of visiting saints. Um, and, is, and that has a lot of um, parallels to the Muslim concept of the musem, um, also visiting graves of, of holy revered figures. Um, also, Arab Jews referred to God as Allah in their writings. Arabic was the language of daily religious life. Um, I happen to have had a blessed memory of a grandmother named Nazima from Baghdad. And when we fell as kids, she would always say, Smala, which I later learned was actually Bismillah, right, in the name of Allah. Um, that I guess that was her way of, of sort of trying to protect us. So there are all these, um, you know, overlaps in terms of language, custom. Um, there was also a shared struggle of Muslim and Jewish communities in Gaza against Christian missionaries in the early 20th century, and this joint resistance brought about a theological collaboration uh, between a rabbi named Nisi Mohana and Sheikh Abdullah El Alami, and they co-authored a question, an, an essay on questions of faith. So there was also a shared, you know, theological writing, um, and also more generally, rabbis in the Muslim world um, before uh, the Arab Jews came en masse to, to Israel-Palestine in the 1950s, rabbis would look to devout Muslim environments as models and grounds for religious piety. Um, and these persist today in um, the Haredi Teshuva movement among Mizrahi Jews, that often um, Islam and the teaching of Imams is seen as very uh, influential in those spheres. Now, um, both Nisim Leon and Daniel Schrader point out that this European conflict between the religious and the secular, you know, and the way that the European Enlightenment seems to see these as diametrically opposed, um, this did not present itself in the same way for Jews from the Muslim world as it did for Ashkenazi or European Jews. Um, and modernization in the Islamic world did not mean complete secularization um, in the way that, that it did, or at least purported to in Europe. Uh, Schrader points out that for European Jews, enlightenment, emancipation, and citizenship were key factors in modernization, but this was not the case for Jews in Muslim lands. Uh, they actually followed processes of modernization and secularization as they took place in the Islamic world, where these processes did not cancel out a commitment to Islam. And uh, this only really seems contradictory as anthropologist Talal Assad has shown when it's applied against a Western or European logic in which enlightenment values call for a complete break with religion and, the, and religion and secularism are seen as diametrically opposed. Um, but really this break with the uh, break between religion and theology is anathema to processes of modernization in the Muslim world, according to Lyon, where Islam remains a way of thinking in a form of political life, and it remains vital even within secular political expressions. Secularization often meant a more moderate outlook and a mitigation of restrictions, but never a complete abandonment of faith. Um, as the poet I'm going to talk about, Haviva Padaya, has noted, God died within Islamic Jewish consciousness, but not completely. Um, and the next part of this story is that after this symbiosis came about and this 
this particular form of secularization that led to a more flexible, tolerant kind of uh, Jewish practice, migration to Israel-Palestine severed these groups from that environment in which that heterogeneity, which again was rooted in Islamic culture, came about. In this encounter with Zionism, where again, national identity as Jewish, Jewish becomes a national identity rather than a form of, of, of theological religious practice, right? Um, this becomes again entwined with political sovereignty. And so not only were Jews from Muslim lands slotted into economically and racially inferior positions, they confronted a state that imposed its secular religious binary on their more flexible expressions of Jewishness. So on the one hand, you had an attempt to sort of secularize and, and enlighten this population according to Western ideals. Um, so Ella Shohat talks about how religious Yemenite Jews uh, were shorn of their peot, their side locks, and they were put like, like all Mizrahim into uh, schools that, that followed this policy of mamlachtiyut, which is most closely translated as statism. And these mamlachti schools made a very clear break between um, what was the uh, uh, sort of secular Chiloni education system um, and the Dati education system, and then there were also yeshivot. Um, and so the more kind of religious devout Mizrahim were then funneled into the Ashkenazi Haredi movement. Um, you may have heard of Aryeh Derry, um, who is in the, the Shas party, and uh, many Sephardi Jews wear, you know, the gabardines and hats of Ashkenazi Jews, um, precisely because of, of that phenomenon, right? They're not, you're not going to wear like a thick wool coat in Morocco. Um, so, so that's, you know, a, a symptom. Um, and really, there, there was no state support for anything that resembled that flexible Mizrahi Jewish practice. Um, and so, so again, there's been these attempts to sort of rehabilitate Masortiyut. Um, and one of them is um, associated with a philosopher named Meir Buzaglo, who happens to be the son of this great Moroccan Paitan, uh, David Buzaglo. And Buzaglo's social movement, which is called Tikkun, is a sort of explicitly Masorti Mizrahi movement. It's a social movement that proposes Masortiyut as a kind of third option for all Jewish Israelis. Um, so the idea is that no matter what kind of Jewish Israeli you are, you can adopt this form of flexible practice and it might bring you closer to tradition. And Buzaglo has um, a philosophy, he has a book called Spat um, the, the Language of the Faithful, which outlines his philosophy of Masortiyut. Um, and, and my problem with it is that it relies very much on the language of continuity, right? Masora itself, just like the English word tradition, is that which is passed on. Um, and I think it doesn't take into account this complete rupture and break that was instituted. Um, and I think as a consequence, um, it wants to sort of rehabilitate Masorti within a purely exclusively Jewish context, um, which is not what it is or ever was. It really, it, again, was so nurtured in the Islamic environment um, that to not acknowledge that it was torn out of it um, and just kind of assume that there can be continuity in a, in a state uh, where, again, Judaism Jewishness becomes national sovereignty, becomes national identity, um, seems to really miss the point of this break. And also, um, I think, miss the potential to rehabilitate Masortiyut in a way that, that can somehow re-encounter Islam um, and, and open itself up um, to other forms of Jewishness that, that aren't only national sovereignty. Um, and, and here I sort of side more with Yadgar, uh, whom I mentioned. And for Yadgar, again, right, Zionism really reduces Jewish identity to this privileged form of nationality. And so Masortiyut can offer 
new ways of thinking about that Jewish national sovereignty. Um, do I have time to get into my literary examples? I don't. Okay, so I had some literary examples um, and maybe I can get into them in the Q&A, but um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Noah. What an, what an amazing talk and, and, and so many uh, reflections already sort of, you know, lightening up in my head, but I want to save them for, for a little later and, and we can get into these conversations around secularism, navigating it with our commitment to our religions and, and the areas in which we situate ourselves socially and develop intellectually. It, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but it is my honor now to introduce Dr. Jerusha Rhodes. Um, I want to say that I personally benefited a lot from her writing. Uh, just, just, the, uh, just the way that she identifies herself as a Muslim theologian is such a refreshing, um, uh, it, it's a very refreshing term in, in Western academia, especially with relation to women's studies in, in Islam here in the West. Um, I, I think we have our own uh, problems that colonialism brought, brought about, you know, uh, identifying our own terms of liberation, identifying our own terms on, on what is gender equality. To, so to read about your Muslim theology, Jerusha, was, was an amazing uh, support and encouragement when I was writing my dissertation. Your Never Holy Other book that you wrote was also uh, appreciated and spoken about a lot by one of my students, Katie Dickinson, who was on the call today. And she's, she's, I'm sure she's enjoying this. And she's the one who introduced us to your book and she was blown away uh, by that book as well. So I'm, I'm really honored and I hope that you'll have time to tell us even about your divine words and female voices, the other work that, uh, that, is, that is amazing. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm going to stop here and actually just introduce you, <laughs> uh, introduce you here. Uh, Jerusha, Dr. Jerusha Tanner Rhodes is a Muslim theologian, I'll say it again, a scholar and a public educator. Uh, she's Associate Professor of Islam and Interreligious Engagement and the Director of Islam, Social Justice and Interreligious Engagement Program at the Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. Uh, and her work focuses on Islamic feminism, interreligious engagement, religious pluralism, and social justice, everything that we honor and commit ourselves here at the GTU. So it is such a privilege to welcome you to this talk. Uh, and if I can just take another a few seconds to introduce your talk, your talk is titled Muslim Theology as Comparative Theology. And this talk will focus on the potential and value of comparative approaches in Muslima theology. I, I've said this for another time now, and Muslima, for those who are, who've heard this word for the first time, is the female cognate or the feminine cognate of the word Muslim. So Muslim would be a male believer, although grammatically it would include both, but Muslima is really iterating the, the, the feminine presence in, in that faith. Um, and her talk is going to explore the comparative value of that. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jerusha Droves. Thank you so much. I'm not sure I have a talk to give anymore. <laughs> I think perhaps the highlights have been given. So um, that is just indicative of um, the quality of the gathering today and my appreciation for being here. So I'm really looking forward to being in conversation. And the good news is that I am actually going to talk about my book, Divine Words, um, Female Voices, and I'm really going to focus on methodology. And I need to set my timer and I have some slides for you because I think um, it is helpful um, for us. I am not seeing, is everybody seeing me on the screen center? Because I am not seeing myself centered on the screen. Okay, perfect. As long as it looks um, fine from other places, then that is fine. Um, I am going to talk mostly about methodology. And so I'm happy to share some examples from the book, but I really want to talk about the methodological piece first. Um, before I do that, I just um, want to note that um, the talk that we've just heard and this discussion of overlaps and symbiosis and conversation and the ways that we might organically learn from each other by living with and among each other is um, an interesting connection with what I'm going to talk with, about, which is about how we might foster ways to be in better relationship and I think maybe more ethical and effective relationship across and amidst diversity. And so I just want to frame that because we, I'm going to be talking from a theological and method 
methodological angle, but I think that this is perhaps one through line that we can hold on to as we um, talk together. Okay, so let me um, pull up my slides really quickly. This should take just one second. Um, so if I've referenced something and I should become a floating head, yes, there I am. Okay, I'll probably move myself around periodically, no worries. But um, let's let's go. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the methodology coming out of my second book, which is there called Divine Words, Female um, Voices. And I think that Matthew is sending a, um, sharing a discount code because it just came out in paperback and it's really discounted at the moment. So now's their chance if you're interested. Um, I'm always looking for ways to like you know get the Oxford price down, and this is very down. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is comparative feminist theology and Muslim theology. Specifically, I'm going to talk about three things, um, and maybe four, but probably not four, given the time constraints. Um, the first, I'm going to talk about the importance of method in general, especially in feminist or Muslim theology. I want to talk a little bit about the why of comparison. And then I'm going to talk about the how of comparative feminist theology, specifically Muslim comparative feminist theology. And that how question is the method question. Um, I'm going to be speaking specifically out of my work, um, which is Muslim constructive theology in conversation largely with um, diverse Christian womanist, feminist, and muharista voices, um, in hopes, however, that that specific engagement will have um, productive resonances for your own interest and your own work. So let's do a slide. So let's begin with the importance of method. I wanna begin by underscoring that method is as important as content in feminist theologies. The way we do our work, the how, is central to the quality and effectiveness of our arguments that we articulate and the actions that we take. Comparative feminist theology as a specific method is an attempt to bring Muslim and feminist commitments into the approach itself, rather than just the content or the audience or the goal. So rather than just like talking about women or talking about gender, how can we talk about a method that would be attentive to those same um, commitments and goals? So yes, I'm interested in gender and sex as content. I'm engaging with women scholars and activists, and I'm interested in moving closer to, a more, to more egalitarianism and equity but I'm ultra also interested in the way that we engage. What tools can we use? What tools do we use? Should we use? What tools are effective? What tools are ethical? What tools are capable of advocating for specific actions without downplaying diversity? These are all methodological questions, as you can see. So in this book, um, Divine Words, um, I'm just trying to see if I'm on the right slide. Yeah. So in this um, book, Divine Words, I apply these methods to Muslim theology. But such questions are also important to, I assume, your varied interest and learning. So what methods do the scholars and writers and people that you're engaging with use when they're um, speaking comparatively? Are there certain methods that are more common in specific religious traditions, whether it be in Judaism, in Christianity, in Buddhism, in indigenous traditions? Why or why not are these methods more common or more commonly used? We can compare feminist methods as well as feminist concerns, texts, topics, et cetera, across traditions. And also we can ask what methods do we tend to use when we begin to think theologically or compare practices or um, teachings across traditions? We usually have default methods that we turn to, just some of them, so you can begin thinking are often um, comparison is based upon, let's find the thing that's shared, right? Let's find the common ground, the way we're all the same. And sometimes it's based in a more polemic vein on let's find the thing that reiterates how important we are and how different and devalued you are right that's another way to go about comparison but we have some kind of default methods and so just as we begin thinking together we want to be asking about you know we want to be considering the importance of method and how it does under um, underlie all of the work that we will do comparatively after that point right, let me change the slide all right so there are two why questions related to comparison that I want to talk about. One is a general question, and then one is specific to comparative feminist theology and to Muslim theology as comparative feminist theology. 
So the general why question is, why are we engaging in comparison? <laughs> It's like a really simple question, but this is about the intentionality of, you know, making, rendering your method and commitments visible. There are many different ways to and reasons to compare. Sometimes we compare to prove that we're all the same, as I just said. Sometimes we compare to emphasize total difference. Sometimes to claim superiority or to assert inferiority. Some comparison is presented as mere analysis. We're just looking at what's in the historical record or the artifacts on the ground. It's presented as having no agenda and no assumptions. But comparative analysis is never neutral or objective. This is one of um, the, the tenets of generally agreed upon feminist methodology and positioning. There is no neutral ground from which to conduct any kind of comparative analysis or scholarship. Um, in fact, the assertion of a neutral ground is an androcentric norm that feminist theologies and woman, womanist the, theologies and Muslim theologies push back upon. So if there's no neutral ground and no, for, no neutral ground or standpoint or foundation for comparison, so then we have to probe why we are compare, comparing. Why do we do it? What's our goal? What are our underlying assumptions? The more specific why question here in comparative feminist theology is why should feminist and Muslim theology theologians and scholars engage comparatively? What are the reasons to do so? What are the risks and the obstacles to doing so? And what are the potential benefits to doing so? So in my um, research, I write about the specific whys or reasons for comparative Muslim theology. The primary one, from my perspective, is that interreligious feminist engagement can be a rich source of insights in the ongoing development of constructive Islamic feminist theology, if historical and epistemological challenges can be confronted and navigated. And that's a big and important if. There can be insights, there can be things learned if we can be upfront about some of the challenges that do repeatedly and often incur, um, occur in these kind of comparative conversations. So to tap into this resource, we must acknowledge that interreligious feminist engagement is not actually actually new. More importantly, it has not always been a productive endeavor. We must acknowledge the challenges and realities of much interreligious feminist engagement. So um, as Aisha Hidayatullah and Zain Qasim, for example, note, um, while interreligious engagement or interreligious feminist engagement is often assumed to be beneficial, right? It's relationship building, it's getting to know people, it's being in conversation. So it's often assumed to be beneficial. In Muslim Christian engagement in particular, but not only, it can be a site of harm and risk, primarily due to some of the power and structural issues interpersonally, but also institutionally that frame those conversations. And so it's often characterized, for example, by language and concerns being drawn from Christian traditions primarily. It's also characterized by, you know, the ever present myth of liberating Muslim women at the hands of Christian liberation Operators, right? Um, but more significantly beyond these tropes is that it's often also characterized by just simply a lack of knowledge across traditions. There's nothing like lack of knowledge and learning to really stunt or truncate comparative engagement. We like to do a lot of comparative engagement without taking time to learn, which is the fa fascinating thing about it. But it's very hard to learn something substantial without a commitment to learning before comparing. And so all of these realities create expectations and assumptions of parity across traditions. Let me check my time. I think I think I am fine with time. Hold on one second. So they create assumptions of parity across traditions. For example, um, one such assumption is that Muslim and Christian women would have similar questions about and approaches to, um, for example, their respective scriptures, the Quran and the Bible. Um, despite these really real challenges, interreligious feminist engagement, in my opinion, is both theologically and practically necessary. Theologically speaking, within Islamic traditions and sources, and by the way, this is the topic of the first book that has been referenced, um, um, Never Holy Other, which deals with um, Quranic perspectives on religious diversity. So you can go read that if you're interested. I'm just going to say one thing and move on. But within Islamic traditions and sources, the Quran 
in one way describes the existence of multiple religious traditions as an intentional ayatollah, which means like a sign of God, but more importantly, theologically means something in the world or in creation that if you study it, learn about it, reflect upon it, you will be directed back towards God. So if multiple traditions, religious diversity is being described as an ayatollah, then we need to be doing some learning. This is a very important and equivocal verse that indicates that there needs to be some kind of interaction. And so there's something to be learned. If traditions are described in this way, then there's an imperative to engage diversity beyond mere tolerance or valuing. There is something to be learned from and amid diversity. Practically speaking, since interreligious feminist engagement is already happening, sometimes implicitly, sometimes unnamed, and sometimes um, premised upon unproductive caricatures, our work as comparative, as feminist theologians, Muslim theologians, is embedded always in a comparative setting. For those of us who work in the US context on Islam and other non-dominant traditions, there's simply no escaping the comparative backdrop. We will engage in some way whether that will be passively, poorly, or productively is perhaps the only question. Since comparative engagement is happening, strategies for explicit and conscientious comparative engagement are necessary. The question is not whether to engage comparatively. The question really is how to engage. And so this is a question of method. On a more pra positive practical note, there is something, many things to learn. While it's accurate that hegemonic and universal feminisms stifle the agencies of diverse Muslim women, it's also true that this is not the whole reality of religious feminisms. There are many scholars and, and theologians who have critiqued these forms of feminism and articulated other variations like muhrista feminism and womanism and African women's theology. And these critiques and articulations come out of very similar concerns as those voiced by Muslim women scholars. This alone indicates that we have so much to learn from each other. I, to reiterate, I'm discussing this from a Muslim perspective, especially in conversation with Christian feminist theologies. The issue of power dynamics and horizontal violence, however, manifest in diverse ways among traditions. In using a comparative feminist theological method, you, we will seek to be attentive to these realities within, for example, between white Christian feminists and black womanists, fem, womanists within Christianity, but also among traditions, for example, between Christianity and Judaism. The particular histories and sometimes transgressions need to be acknowledged and attended to in order not to be replicated through assumptions of universal goals and sameness. So now here's the question. How do we do this, right? Is there a method of engagement that would mitigate against some of these common challenges and open doors to meaningful interreligious feminist engagement? My argument in Divine Words is that comparative feminist theology is one such method. So let me change my slide. This should be the last one I'm going to do. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So here we go. So what is the actual process of comparative feminist theology or the actual method. Comparative feminist theology as a method builds critically upon the general method of comparative theology. Now, this is not a, just a general term, it's a technical term for a broader field, and, and some of you will know that. So, um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that more. I'm just gonna say a few things about it and move on to um, the feminist theology contributions. So comparative theology defined by Francis X. Clooney is, describes, quote, and this is a quote, acts of faith seeking understanding, which are rooted in a particular faith tradition, but which venture into learning from one or more other faith traditions. And here's the important part. Why? For the sake of fresh theological insights. So comparative theology is a double process of venturing out of one's own tradition or traditions to learn deeply about and from other traditions and then returning to one's own tradition or traditions with new insights, new questions and perspectives. More specifically, it's a process that, one, requires knowledge of one's own tradition, backgrounds and contexts. 
Two, begins with deep learning about the other. So that's what I was talking about before. And this learning on their own terms, this requires a deep commitment to learning and to knowledge. Three, it then engages in limited acts of comparison. So not grand scheme comparisons like Bible to the Quran or major figure to major figure, small, small moments of comparison. And then uses that small acts of comparison as the basis of constructive theological reflection in the theologian's own tradition or traditions. Comparative feminist theology follows this basic process. And I think I might have another slide here. So let me see. Yep, there we go. Um, comparative feminist theology follows this basic process with a few key modifications. Let me put myself here. Okay. First, it centers what Michelle Voss Roberts calls the outsider within traditions. Rather than insider orthodoxies, it focuses on feminist discourse, texts, and practices. Second, it revisits the way the fruits or fresh, fresh theological insights of comparative engagement are received by and resonate with the original tradition. So in comparative theology, communal resonance is one of the ways to gauge the authority and authenticity of your constructive reflection. But in comparative feminist theology, you can, you can begin to imagine that just the way that most feminist, womanist, Muslim reflections can be very rooted in tradition, but also very easily dismissed by people who would like to uphold certain orthodoxies. It means that resonance as a standard has to be modified. And so communal resonance is important, but feminist theologies are more interested in provocative communal resonance. That is in stirring people and communities to embark upon difficult yet imperative conversations. Third, comparative feminist theology does not avoid all grand narratives I've often stated by early comparative theologians. Um, it aims rather to use theological insights to foster deep solidarity and to further pursue equality and egalitarianism. And then fourth, comparative feminist theology is especially attentive to expectations of sameness and parity in concerns, in methodology and in constructive theologies. So such expectations are frequent areas of power and horizontal violence, as mentioned, among religious feminisms. In addition, by valuing both difference and similarities and seeing both as sites of engagement among traditions, so differences and similarities identified on the basis of deep knowledge, right? This method allows for the identification of richer and more meaningful theological analogies. We discover that some analogies that seem initially meaningful or obvious, for example, um, the existence of sacred texts in many different traditions, we discover that these analogies that seem like such good starting points are actually less meaningful than other analogies. We use our knowledge to guide the identification of new analogies rather than identifying the analogies and then pursuing content that helps us to build up an argument about those analogies. So for example, in my work, and I'm almost done, so I have two minutes, so I'm gonna be, <laughs> there we go. So in my work, for example, this method leads me to focus on the central analogy of the two divine words. That is the analogy between the Quran and Jesus instead of the more common analogy of Jesus and Muhammad or the Quran and, um, and the Bible or other scriptures. When one looks at the concerns, the questions, and the struggles against androcentrism, this deeper analogy, this becomes a deeper analogy than the alternatives. It's also a less hegemonic one. It does not reinforce sameness across traditions. And more importantly, it creates these opportunities for theological insights. And so just quickly to summarize, through this kind of process that I've just talked about in a really rudimentary way, through, through knowing our, our own and, and learning about another deeply, and then looking for moments of intersections or questions that weren't raised in our tradition or overlaps and analogies. I always use this, this example, but I think it's fruitful. It's that we're staying, we're in our same tradition, um, but through our learning, it's like, I'm in my room now, right? But see, my, my picture is different because I turned off the light. Comparative theology or comparative feminist theology as a process is like we're in our room still, 
But through the knowledge that we have gained, it's as if there's a new light on. And what we see is new facets, new options. We, we encounter new questions and we bring them back, not through a process of co-optation or transposition or just like, I'm going to take something from Christianity or Judaism and do it in my tradition. No, it's that we're, we're confronted through the deep learning and the commitment to this process with difference and resonance that makes us raise new questions in our tradition. And some of those questions will raise and the answer will be, nothing's happening here. This is not a good question for my tradition or community. But other questions will open up whole new theological vistas to us that are, that are wildly productive, both for solidarity and egalitarianism and just reckoning with the many ways in which we fail to recognize the full humanity of too many people every day. And so this is just a brief intro to kind of the methodology and I'm happy to talk more about the application through a concrete example. But yes, my, my alarm just went off so I hope that the time is good, okay? So with that, thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jerusha. Oh my goodness. I, I feel as if you've just laid for us, laid out for us the possibilities of engagement, so aware, so thoughtful, and with so much potential um, that I know will really support us here at the Graduate Theological Union as we think about these relationships and how to foster them and how they might yield the insights and the understandings that they that they can that they have the potential to do um i think just, just i will say again those of you who are here and we have a wonderful steady group um you know sometimes these zooms start and they're very full and as the hour goes on they dwindle nope we're everyone's here um and as majabin just put in the chat we are hoping that those of you who are here will put some questions in the q a that majabin and i will then kind of moderate and propose to our speakers i'm sure i'm not the only one who wishes we had been able to hear for a full hour from each of you so what i would like to do is ask a question that each of you can take up just so we can hear a little bit more of your thinking on your topic and i think i can ask a similar question of both of you which is i think both of you named a very important phenomena that, um, ah, the, in a way that are sort of unique to the modern period, and you're proposing paradigms of, in, of engagement, or in the case of Noah, paradigms of religious life that are sometimes obscured by more dominant modalities. But I think there's room for each of you to then perhaps talk a bit more about gender as it inflects the paradigm. So Noah, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about this, this wonderful pattern of living, this dynamic, um, flexible way of living religiously, going to synagogue and playing soccer. I wondered if you thought about whether that Masura T option is actually mass male. And if you've given thought to women in the Mizrahi or Jewish Arab world and the challenge they might face in a formation of, of a, a cultural life that retains that pattern, that rich pattern that you've laid out for us. And, and then Jerusha, if you as you've laid out this model of interreligious engagement, both the obstacles things like you said, not knowing, ignorance, um, structural imbalances, um, tendencies to seek sameness. I'm wondering again, if you could uh, maybe speak about how the gender of the participants and also their, their, their religious, uh, the gendered religious functions play a role also in the interreligious engagement. So perhaps Noah, would you take a bit of time to reflect and then we'll turn to you, Jerusha, just to go in the order of the talks. You're on mute. So the phrase of 2022. Um, so it's a great question. And I think Again, I, returning to um, the kind of variegated and uh, sort of continuum type nature of Masorti identity. So um, there were many different kinds of groups really that we can say were part of a Mizrahi 
Jewish atmosphere or really, I mean, to say Mizrahi is kind of anachronistic, but you know, in, in the Muslim world. So um, there were, you know, Jews who were more cosmopolitan, say in Cairo and Baghdad, um, who were allied with, um, say, communist movements and anti-colonial movements. And then there were more, um, you know, devout kind of rabbinically, halakhically informed communities. Um, and so I think that there were a range of different kinds of identities and subject positions available. And I think where women come in um, is that they really had many different kinds of positions available to them. So um, without in any way sort of idealizing some perfectly tolerant view, I think um, in more conventional halachic paradigms in, in European ones, um, often women aren't, women are, you know, very much shut out of a lot of halakha, except for, I think, you know, lighting Shabbat candles. Like, there are very few mitzvot that women are commanded to do. Um, but I think that Masortiyut takes us out of that structure. So there are really many different kinds of ways of, of being that are available. Um, and actually in the example that I, one of the examples that I had was of a novel of a community of Moroccan Jews that experience is really like a kind of communal breakdown, but at the same time, there's all these kinds of memories and traces of this shared Muslim life, like almost this kind of like melancholia. Um, and, it, and it's by a Moroccan, not Moroccan, now Jewish Israeli novelist named Albert Suisa. Um, and I think a lot of it is based on Suisa's own family. And his father was very learned and devout and his mother, was not at all, you know, bar barely any kind of Jewish practice and um, was Francophone and loved French literature and passed that on to him. Um, so, you know, just in that kind of anecdotal example that becomes a basis for the characters, um, you have a paradigm of a, a woman who, or, or an example of a woman who's, um, you know, connected to what we might think of as secular literature and a father who's very devout and these can coexist in one family. Um, and, you know, in this case, it happens to be the mother who we might, who is kind of more modern, right? And that she is actually in some ways um, in touch with, um, you know, more cosmopolitan versions of literature, right? Whereas in a kind of more conventionally halakhic environment, we might think of the woman as somehow, um, not as, you know, prominent, not as having, you know, not as enabled by that structure, which of course I know is kind of loaded. We can think about it all kinds of ways, but I think Masor Tiyut, um offers a, a lot of different options. Um, and I think another connection to gender that's really a much more abstract one has to do with the role of the Shina in um, some of the the poetry that I uh, look at, um, particularly in the work of Khabiba Padaya, who comes from a long line of Kabbalists and is herself a scholar of Kabbalah and a poet. Um, and she uh, writes a lot about how the figure of the Shechina, which came about um, in mostly in the Zohar, uh, in, in medieval Jewish exegesis as the kind of feminine aspect of the divine, um, how the, the wandering of the Shechina is so important, uh, like, like wandering is in walking, um, because it, it, it is a totally different paradigm of exile that's represented by the feminine, the feminine who accompanies um, the, the Israelites on their wanderings and, and the Jews on their wanderings. And in particular for her, it's the um, the context of the Spanish expulsion that's very important, that the Shechina was seen as, as accompanying the Jews wan wandering away um, from, from Spain. Um, and, and so for her, um, there are kind of rituals of exile that she, that she studies that are Kabbalistic, um, that are again associated with the feminine and, and there are ways of walking through trauma and working through trauma 
through reproducing exile, which is very much in contrast to how the mainstream political Zionist narrative wants to see exile, which is something to be negated and a defective condition that must be remedied through national sovereignty. And so I think in that case, the feminine is a kind of, um, at least in this kind of more abstract mystical way, um, like a kind of interruption or a challenge to that idea. Thank you so much, Noah. Jerusha. So, sure. Um, so, I mean, working as, you know, writing constructive Muslim theology, gender is very much the center of what I'm doing. I mean, I, my primary investment here is in um, constructing in my writing and research options for um, Muslims to embrace, right? That's the objective. I mean, there is scholarship here, but it is also very much about communities that I care about. And I don't just say, you know, Muslim women, because I mean all Muslims to consider and, and reflect upon. And so gender is very much implicated there. And that includes masculinity, and that includes non-binary, and that includes, you know, the way we set up categories, as well as women in particular. So that's one way that it's included. Another way that it's included is that with this method of comparative feminist theology, and this um, using Voss Roberts idea of the outsider within, it's a different type of engagement that normally happens in whether it's in compar just com comparative analysis or comparative theology more specifically, which is usually to take the kind of more, most centered, most orthodox, most well-known voice. And we know all of the androcentric and patriarchal norms, whether they be in publishing or just in traditions and continuity that happen across traditions. And that means that in that voice is more like that is voice is um, often likely to be a male voice, right? And so who are these outsiders within that who are deeply committed to their traditions and deeply embedded in their communities, but are not heard? So that's one question. And I'm hearing that in what Noah's saying. I'm thinking like my mind is going, oh, this is so fascinating. I mean, there's all sorts of resonances already popping up of how even this example would be such a great site of comparative feminist theological engagement, but it often would not be, right? Like it would often be a more centered and more male and more androcentric example. And so looking for those within traditions, but then also placing them in conversation in an ethical way, right? And so that is all, you know, and, and I would say not just for the conversation's sake, but for the why that I was talking about. And that's that there's really something to learn and not just intellectually learn, but learn in a way that improves the lives of people and limits harm to people. Okay, so there's this real concrete payoff. And then I guess I just, you know, we'll get a little bit um, more specific about some of the obstacles. Um, I'm fully committed to the potential and potency of comparative feminist theological engagement. I've seen it. I write about it. I'm fully committed. But it's also important to say that another way that gender manifests, especially in any kind of comparative engagement with Islam, is, is gendered Islamophobia. I mean, gender is a primary site of dehumanizing and demeaning Islam and Muslims. And whether that is, you know, that's not just women, but it's across the board. And so it is very hard, even in academic or scholarly spaces, to get past those superficial tropes of gendered Islamophobia. And that is one thing in and of itself, but, I, but it also has a sort of shadow side to it, where it's not just... Um, you know, you can have a, you can have those gendered assumptions about, you know, even your doctor so and so, but you're still the passive Muslim woman, right? Like it's 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 fascinating. They're so prevalent. But the uh, then that's one thing. The thing that concerns me more is a little bit of a shadow side or flip side of that, and that is that those tropes have become so prevalent that they have gained legs within communities as well. And the way that that manifests is that frequently, for example, in Muslim communities, work such as, that has anything to do with feminism or talks about gender or is about egalitarian is often cast off as being, you know, the importation from outside within the tradition. I will say here, I don't buy that and I write extensively about it. I think it is a product of Islamophobia that has now been 
absorbed within communities um, and it is not a historically relevant category um, but it really does manifest mostly around gender and so one of the easiest ways for example to dismiss conversations about um, egalitarianism and gender is to say, within muslim communities is to say oh well this is not about islam this is about something else this comes from outside right and the outside is usually that stereotyped um gender stereotyped outside as well so I, I think I would end that. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. I, I had a question of my own, but I'm seeing that some questions are coming in our chat and I wanted to uh, allow room for our participants to engage. So uh, Jerusha, you have a question there from Katie. You have a remark and a comment there from uh, Sister Marianne Farina, another very valuable asset here to us at the GTU. Uh, and I'm wondering if you wanna take a moment to respond to that. Um, so yes, I am familiar with building bridges. I um, am a Georgetown alum, so <laughs> I would be, I would be, um, you know, in trouble if I wasn't. I, I have not participated in them just because of scheduling things of the sort, but I am very familiar with them. And so, um, and I was trained at Georgetown. So much of this thinking is um, not thinking I, I received at Georgetown, but it was cultivated there under the guidance of many of my teachers there. So I'll just say that. And then um, in response to the question from Katie, I would say in my book, I talk about two other analogies that draw out from this central analogy of the divine words, which is the recentering around Quran and Jesus. But drawing out of that, I then moved to talk about um, biblical texts in conversation with a hadith, which is really significant because a lot of people try to do um, use biblical hermeneutics, um, especially hermeneutics of suspicion and remembrance and all this kind of stuff, and apply it comparatively to the Quran. But it does not quite work because the theological assumptions are not the same. So see what learning gets us? We learn and we say, well, we don't think of our texts in that way, and that's okay. So your methods may not work on this text, but what about this other textual corpus? And there they can be very fruitful. So there's the analogy of biblical text in the Hadith and a really rich conversation there, especially since a Hadith are understudied in Muslim reflections and feminist reflections. And then the other analogy I talk a lot about is um, Prophet Muhammad and Mary. And you know, people like to compare Muhammad and Jesus, that's the usual move. But in fact, if you get into feminist and womanist and Muslim thinking, um, there's a lot more um, reflection on the gendered embodiment of these two vessels of the word um, that is really provocative and helpful. Um, so not just provocative with no goal, but provocative in terms of what I was saying about recognizing the full humanity of people and creating traditions that are sustaining and um, inclusive um, in the best of ways. Thank you so much. I'm seeing uh, questions dropping into the Q&A and I'm also keeping an eye, you know, an eyeball at the time as well. So uh, I, I, this is just fantastic. I, I had a response very quickly about, you know, the liminal space. And I, I understand that outsider within, uh, within my own work, I've seen that, you know, sometimes the questions that I pose are too radical uh, for the traditional way or the orthodox way in which the Muslim community has engaged with this tradition. And at the same time, it's not, it's too religious or too committed to religion for an academic, secular, feminist discussion. So I, I, I sort of uh, resonate with, with that uh, liminal space. And, and that is why I think I appreciate constructive feminist work uh, and comparative feminist work as well. So um, I, I don't wanna, I, I feel very bad taking up even that one minute to share that because we have some questions here, which I think we should privilege uh, at this moment. And we were hoping to wrap up in the next two, three minutes. So we have a question by Sarah uh, here. And I, and I think she's um, putting this question to both our speakers, both talks so thought provoking, thank you. Both of you mentioned examples, Noah from literature and Jerusha of application that you didn't have time for in your talks. I would love to hear a bit of those from both of you and assume that others would as well. So I, I don't know if that gives us um, enough time to talk, but if you just wanted to respond to that, both of you in, in any order that you wish. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go quickly. So I did mention a couple of the examples in, in response to Dina's question, um, but 
Um, and actually, it's interesting now after hearing Jerusha's talk, I'm like, oh, maybe it's too matchy matchy what I'm trying to say. But um, part one, one of the things that I, I sort of wanted to bring up is this kind of idea, um, you know, maybe it's quaint to talk about Derrida in 2022, but of sort of the trace in the sense that it's both absent and present, right? That, that literature and, um, and poetry and text have a way of kind of rendering the absent present and the present absent. Um, and, and that it's through simultaneously this, this memory of what was lost, but the acknowledgement of the loss in terms of a Muslim Jewish symbiosis that I think the literature really brings out. Um, so um, there's an instance in, in Akud, the novel I mentioned, um, at really it, even the, the name, the, the bound um, suggests the binding, which conventionally is, in, in Hebrew literature, which has this close association, obviously, with Jewishness, is the binding of Isaac. Um, but actually, in Akud, it's also interpreted as the binding of Ishmael. Um, and, and so um, there's, you know, one of the um, children, child characters is about to be bar mitzvah, and he keeps, keeps looking back to this time um, in Morocco with his Muslim nanny and, you know, she's kind of like this second mother and he keeps thinking that he's Ishmael. Um, and so you see kind of an identification in the novel shift from all these questions that the children have about Isaac to then all of a sudden this boy really identifying with Ishmael and with um, being basically raised in Islam. Um, and he really starts to think that he's mus Muslim and, and then actually he's sort of disintegrates, like it's a kind of a stream of consciousness and it sort of ends in this almost incoherent way. Um, and I think that by preserving both this idea of disintegration and breakdown um, and also simultaneously this remembered connection to, to Islam, there's a sense that maybe some of this connection can be ret retained after the encounter with Zionism and, and maybe it can be reimagined. Um, in, in another way than what nationalism tells us. Uh, sorry, I, I like matchy matchy. <laughs> I, I, and, then that, and that's fascinating. I would really like to see the text that you sh were going to share too. So that would be lovely. Um, okay, so let me see. I was going to share an example just of the application of this method, which is virtually impossible to do. So let's see how well I could do in like one minute of, of sharing this just to give something concrete. And so I talked a little bit about the analogies and I, I, don't, I th don't think I'll talk about one of those. But um, I'll just talk about one of the other topics that I, I write about in this book, and that's theological anthropology. And so what we can think about is really that the application of this method is um, somewhat like a reiterative three-step process. So the first process is, you know, knowing your tradition and knowing what is going on around a certain topic. So here it would be theological anthropology within Islamic theology or within even Islamic feminist theology. Um, and then the next step would be to be in conversation and learning with, with other voices. And so in the case of my work, that is um, primarily with, um, with Christian voices, as I mentioned, but also primarily with womanist voices um, in, in that conversation. Then the third step would be to say, like, on the basis of what I know about what's going on in my tradition and some of the questions that are going on, and on the basis of learning and thinking with this other tradition, what new questions do I have? Or are there things I learned over there that might be applicable? Or are there things I learned over there that aren't applicable? And does that help me to learn about what is really important in my tradition as well? And so there's this whole, there's three steps to go through. So let me just um, put a little bit of content on that. So with the theological anthropology, some of you will know um, that, you know, um, a lot of Islamic feminist scholarship is really capitalized on theological anthropology. You know, the Quran has a very, um, you know, egalitarian creation narrative that really helps to be like the one soul divided into all of humanity. And it has done a lot of work for egalitarianism. And so I won't get into that. But for those of you who know, it's about taqwa, it's about fitra, it's about khilafa, and it's it's very empowering and, and also more empowering because you know, all humans stand in exactly the same relationship with God and any usurpation of that relationship is, is you know, is seen as um, a form of disbelief or kufr. Like it's very, very powerful. And I would say very optimistic. And so this is where, this is step one, the scope of the field. What is 
the existing literature conversation going on and what are the questions that are yet unanswered and one of the questions that is not quite grappled with in islamic feminist theological anthropology is it sounds great right so beautiful so optimistic so empowering same relationship but we're not quite in that relationship are we not all of us are some of us are really not free and really not equal. And when you say that people are free and they're not, it doesn't exactly make them free. And so this question of how to deal with what is called a theological constraint, right? How to deal with the constrained realities of our human existence. And so for me, then I go to step two, and that's, let me look at particularly womanist voices, but not only so engaging with like Sean Copeland and Dolores Williams, and even um, Janine Hill Fletcher, who is a Catholic theologian, a white Catholic theologian, because these voices, specific small moments of comparison, are all really interested in what it means to not be free or not necessarily have liberation as the achievable objective. Survival is sometimes the objective. Constrained creativity is sometimes the objective. And they're thinking about the limitations of liberation models of theological anthropology. Wow, lots to think with there. And so just come to step three um, really fast, just to say a few things that this brings up for me not all of it's relevant, right? A lot of what these Christian theologians are talking about is not gonna be relevant and I'm not interested in imposing it upon my tradition, but I am interested in listening. And so what are some of the things that I do wanna listen with or learn from? Well, one is that they talk a lot about visibilization and invisibilization. So when we craft a theolo theological anthropology, when we say something about human nature, we're making some things really visible and other things invisible. And what are those things that we're rendering invisible and are we okay with that? <laughs> and so if we're rendering constraint invisible, are we okay with that? So that's just one. But another thing that's very interesting here and I'll, I'll stop after this is that they both, they it provokes a conversation about who was often taken as an exemplar of theological anthropology. We love to have exemplars and, and a very common exemplar of theological anthropology within Islam, but also within the Quran is Ibrahim, Abraham. He's the Hanif, he's the Muslim man, he is not the Mushrik, you know, he's, he is the example from Muhammad too. Um, but the Islamic Abraham, among other things, is is also kind of an example of theological rugged individualism. You know, he's in his community and his family and he turns to his father and says, oh, I am going to disown all of this and decontextualize myself and free myself of all of these constraints. And it's beautiful, I love it, I'm there for it, but it's really not realistic for most of us. Most of us cannot decontextualize ourselves or remove all of our constraints. And so invoking such an exemplar can actually dehumanize some people because we can't do that. And so it doesn't mean to decenter Ibrahim. I love the Ibrahim model, but is there another model that's more robust? And this is where I'll stop to say that one of the crossover here that's fascinating is to talk about Hajar and Hagar in conversation. They are not the same in the tradition. They are different. In Islam, Hagar is the ultimate center of the tradition, but she's never really seen. It's fascinating, right? And so to just dig into that example and see where it goes constructively and what that means and the implications, read the book, I'm not talking anymore about it, but um, that's just an example of how it would play out. Thank you so much, Jerusha and Noah. Um, I think I'm not the only one whose mind and heart is alight with um, connections and new understandings. Um, there are there were more questions, though we're really at time at this point, really people taken with um, the materials that you're bringing. Uh, Noah, your mention of Shina and the feminine as a characteristic of diaspora and maybe even of Masorati as a third way. Um, and Jerusha, you're kind of naming these paradigms that are available in sacred literature and and the qualities of each. So I, I really wanna just express my gratitude to each of you for bringing your thought and your research to this gathering here, this small gathering here. And I thank you for your time. Um, and I now turn to Majabin uh, to, to wrap up for us. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Tina. Uh, I don't think there's much left, but to iterate the, the thanks and the gratitude to our splendid uh, presenters for today, Noah and Jerusha, thank you so much. You brought such rich thought into our community and you engaged us so beautifully and we thank you for it. And we are so proud of the work that you're doing and, and keep it up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all those who took this time out in the, in the afternoon to join us. Uh, for me, if I can very quickly share an update for the, for the Madrasa Mitrasha, we are so excited to be offering a summer institute. It's a four day institute where we will be looking at Hebrew and Arabic joint language study in the mornings, textual studies in the afternoon, and then there'll be a film screening, uh, screening and, a, and a calligraphy workshop as well. So um, Matt, just drop that into the chat. Please check it out. And we'd love to have you. Thank you for taking the time out. Be well. Uh, enjoy the sacred times wherever you are. Thank you so much.